In this episode of Travelog, we're visiting Harbin, the famous ice city during summer. We'll discover how this former fishing village was transformed into a metropolis of over 10 million residents with a helping hand from the Russians. So, Harbin is known across China and also the world as the ice city because in winter it puts on the famous ice and snow festival. But actually summer is one of the best times to visit this historic city and see the many Russian influences that were instrumental in creating modern Harbin. I'm Taran and welcome to this episode of Travelogue in China. Believe it or not, a little over a century ago, this street was Harbin. Called Zhongyang Dajie or Central Avenue, this cobbled boulevard witnessed the transformation of Harbin from a small fishing village into a modern city. One that was built very much along Russian lines. And the legacy of that time is everywhere to be found. <laughs> Uh, this is definitely the best cure for summer. But actually, uh, it's popular all year round because this ice lolly is one of Harbin's best loved specialties. And the recipe was invented over 100 years ago by a Russian Jew who opened up the modern hotel. And actually, here in Central Avenue, this main pedestrianized street, there are many century old businesses like that Russian restaurant over there. And this probably makes it one of the best starting points for exploring foreign influences here in Harbin. The Modern was once the grandest hotel in Harbin. Its founder was one of many Russians who flocked to this newly built town in search of wealth. And so great was the influx that for two decades, Harbin was home to more Russians than local Chinese. Today, it's the capital of Heilongjiang, China's northeasternmost province, which shares a border with Russia. The city boasts over 10 million residents. Just before the turn of the 20th century, Harbin was chosen to be the headquarters for a brand new railway, funded by what was then the Russian Empire. So the Harbin that you see today is largely thanks to these tracks. They were laid down for the Chinese Eastern Railway, which was built as a shortcut by the Russians for the world's longest railway, the Trans-Siberian. Back then, the city was pretty much split into two, with the Russians and other foreigners living on this side of the tracks and the Chinese living outside the tracks on this side. Obviously, there's no distinction today, but the tracks are still here. And even though they're not running anymore, you can still come up here to see how impressive it would have been back in the days. Though it long ago fell into disuse, this was the first bridge to span Harbin's Songhua River. It formed part of the Chinese Eastern Railway's western branch, a line that extended for over 900 kilometers across northeast China. The bridge is also handy for finding your bearings, since everything to the east of it was once considered outside the tracks. But that doesn't necessarily mean the wrong side, judging by the unique architecture found here. It reminds me a little bit of the UK. This part of town was outside of the tracks, which made it a historically Chinese part of town. But the buildings here look really European, and that's because they were built in a Baroque style. But it's, it's not quite the Baroque that we're used to. It's sort of Chinese Baroque with uh, symbols of bats and grapes, which represent longevity and good wealth. And actually, if you go inside of these houses, it opens up into an inner courtyard. So these would have been fusions of Eastern and Western architecture, Baroque on the outside, and very Chinese on the inside. Ah, so the inside is uh, quite noticeably Chinese, and these buildings would have been owned by merchants who would have seen how grand the Russian buildings were and wanted to kind of emulate it. But obviously, being Chinese, they also wanted to keep some of their own 
uh, style, so that's why they have the European exterior and a very Chinese interior. And this entire building would have been owned by one merchant family uh, using the exterior part for business and the interior part as their living quarters. So it was really the best of both worlds. It wasn't a compromise. The unique blend of architectural styles is all down to the fact that this area was close to the railway tracks and therefore the foreign part of town. Only the wealthiest Chinese could afford to live here. And as an important commercial district, these streets would have been lined with restaurants and tea houses inside which merchants did their business. These days the merchants are gone, but some other shops remain. Man, this area is a haven for foodies. But one place you must try is this dessert shop because apparently the emperor of the Qing dynasty came here himself, tried their desserts and loved it so much he gave them the name that they're still using today. With thousands of cakes on offer, Lao Dingfeng was one of the first businesses to be officially recognized as a China time-honored brand. Look at that. This uh, definitely looks pretty traditional. So this mooncake is this shop's best seller and I've had a lot of mooncake in my time so I'm going to put this to the test. Usually they have uh, egg inside which makes it very tasty but I've been told that this one is, uh, is, is pretty traditional in its recipe. It's been unchanged for over a hundred years so. Mm. It's good, very nutty. It's quite sweet. <laughs> but um, there's, uh, I think there's pine nuts inside. Uh, very flaky. Actually really, really delicious. Of the Russians who helped build Harbin, many were Jewish. They'd come here in the thousands escaping pogroms in the Russian Empire. Together they built the city's first hotels, banks, and of course, places of worship. Now this concert hall is pretty special in that it wasn't originally a concert hall, it was actually a synagogue which uh, first opened its doors to pretty sizable Jewish community here in Harbin back in 1909 and uh, they actually made a really large contribution to the arts in this city and the UN actually appointed Harbin as a city of music and in 2014 this entire synagogue was renovated into this concert hall which now does four performances a week and there's one tonight but I've come early just to check out their rehearsals. At one time, Harbin was home to the largest Jewish community in East Asia. During the 1920s, some 25,000 Jews were living here. It was a time when many renowned Jewish performers, such as violinist Helmut Stern, visited the city. And in turn, they helped to promote the spread of Western music throughout China. Man, I'm starving. I've been checking out Russian architecture the whole day. I think it's about time to actually have some Russian food. Here we go.
just uh, learning a little bit about the restaurant's history. It was opened up by an Armenian gentleman named Tatos uh, at the start of the 20th century, so pretty soon after the Chinese Eastern Railway was established. But the original location wasn't here, it was actually nearby the tracks. And it was actually in 1920 that they moved to this current location, which they've been at ever since. So this restaurant's well over 100 years old. The music-themed decorations here probably allude to the fact that this restaurant once served Fyodor Shalapin, one of Russia's most famous opera singers. He fell ill while visiting Harbin and had food delivered to him every day from this very restaurant. When he left the city, he gave the owner a signed photograph. No doubt the food served here reminded him of home. Mmm. Oh my word. <laughs> this place specializes in food from the Caucasus region. There's certainly no shortage of authentic mm. Russian restaurants in Harbin. And food wise, oh. the city has very much embraced its Russian heritage. The thing is, Usually when you go to a Russian restaurant, you kind of expect very hearty food, and it still is very hearty, but often they have very big portions on a small plate. But here it's kind of, it feels a little bit more like fine dining, and I guess back in the days, to come to a restaurant like this, it really would have been a special occasion. And I think even today a lot of people treat coming to this restaurant, a Western restaurant, as uh, a special occasion event. I've got to say, if you want to have Russian food in China, Harbin is definitely, you know, a safe bet. And I guess it's no wonder that there are so many businesses that have lasted over a century when the quality is this good. Mm. Well, they don't call Harbin the Moscow of the Orient for nothing. Coming up next, I feel like a right glutton as I feast on Harbin's specialty dishes and drink myself silly in front of hundreds of people. Good times. Ah, don't you just love a good queue in the morning? <laughs> as you can see, uh, it's just turned seven. There's a huge line of people that extends almost all the way to the end of the street waiting to get their hands on these sausages. And uh, the store actually closes at 6 p.m. But uh, apparently by 9 a.m. it's completely sold out already. There are even vans waiting outside for the stuff. <laughs> Most visitors to Harbin quickly become aware of its three Russian specialties. Ice lollies, Russian rye bread and Harbin red sausages made according to what was originally a Lithuanian recipe. This means these smoked bangers taste more like the kind you find in Europe rather than in China. However, when it comes to traditional recipes, Harbin is best known for its guobao roll, sweet and sour fried pork. Unlike most restaurants which use tenderloin, here at Jinchun they use pork rump which ensures that after frying, the pork's outer layer is crispy while the inside remains nice and tender. It's one of the many dishes this restaurant serves in its signature banquet. Oh wow, what a feast. I mean, it quite literally is a feast. This is uh, what's called a manhan quan xi. It was an important feast that the emperor put on for his court officials during important events. And um, quick history lesson, the last imperial dynasty of China, the Qing dynasty, was ruled over by the ethnic Manchu people who were originally from northeast China. And the feast that you see now is a more simplified northern style version of what you would have originally had on the table. But I mean, it's still incredibly exquisite. And the best part of it is that even common people like me can now 
uh, try the amazing dishes they have here. But I, I don't actually know uh, what all of these are, so I might need a little bit of help. This is looking more. 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 This is looking 呃，但是现在呢，就是野生动物这块不允许捕杀熊了。对。然后我们就只能说，呃，按照它这个样子啊和味道啊，我们去，呃，效仿它。只能说一点点。呃，这个是外边这皮儿呢是猪肉皮，然后用呃牛肉馅儿，嗯，或者里面这些调料里面都有，有一点点什么呢？有一点松粉，就是那个松仁粉。OK。因为它熊的时候，它吃蜂蜜，它可能它有松香味儿。对对对对对。然后呃，还有一些调料什么的放在一起。呃，放一层肉馅儿，然后蒸，就啊，对，蒸蒸完之后，这个脚趾盖儿。这个脚趾甲，对对对，这个这是豆腐做的，这个是豆腐做的，不是指甲这个。Yeah, definitely no need to worry. This bear isn't going anywhere. 那个挨着它这个，我给你，我得给你好好讲讲它。这个是鱼吗？呃，它是整个黄鱼头骨，基本上都大一点的头骨啊，然后蒸，它整个下来的话得将近六到八小时，能蒸好。这个现在一看着，你看一动。那这是骨头。对呀，因为整个黄鱼它的骨头都是脆骨。Wow. <laughs> okay, that's definitely something to try. Here we go. Fish bone cooked to the point that it's turned into jelly. This is definitely a first for me. Mmm. 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 Cool. I tell you what. I, I when I was a kid, I used to kind of hate eating fish because of all the bones. But this is this has completely turned my world upside down. 真的太棒了。嗯嗯嗯嗯嗯，尝一尝，很好吃，很好吃。好。The other exotic dishes include jellied deer's eyes and fried crocodile, both of which taste better than they sound. You know what they say: the best way to a court official's heart is through his stomach. 那个拖这个蛋清，然后蘸的芝麻渣。But if he's not much of an eater, then there's always his liver. Yes, here we go. The Harbin Beer Festival is officially underway. Happens every single year in July. And even though it was raining earlier, hasn't stopped anyone from coming here and having some fun. So we've actually got five different halls this time. We've got lovely ladies at Budweiser. We've got German beer. We've got Russian beer. We also have snow beer. And of course, there's Harbin beer. And since we're in Harbin City, we've got to support the home team. Here's something you might not know. In 1900, the Russians established China's first modern brewery, right here in Harbin. A little over a century later, Harbin held its first annual beer festival, which is now into its 17th year. And with live performances, dozens of food stalls, and of course, lots of beer, it's no wonder many locals come here as soon as they get off work. I mean, it's 6 p.m. and people are already getting pretty merry. I guess I'd better catch up. I'm a little bit dreading this. I'm gonna go on stage in front of all these people and show off my terrible drinking skill. That's me. <laughs> oh, what have I gotten myself into? Oh, you've got to have a strong liver to live in this part of China.
Well, that, I think he went easy on me. Coming up next, we'll discover a winter wonderland inside a shopping centre before visiting a wonderland with even more of a Russian twist. After all that feasting and boozing, I could really do with a bit of exercise. And that's why I've come to the humongous Wanda Mall. So Harbin is pretty much synonymous with winter. And kind of like how people who live by the seaside all know how to swim, a lot of the people who live in Harbin know how to ski and snowboard. And that's why they've gone and built the world's largest indoor ski resort. So you can still carve up some snow while it's sweltering hot outside. Oh, it's a little bit on the colder side in there. Oh my word. <laughs> it's like we've entered a whole different season. <laughs> I can't believe this entire 80,000 square metre ski dome sits inside a shopping centre. Man, uh, this is what I'm talking about. Whew. That's that's about all I could do. So uh, the slope actually looks pretty long, and they've got six different runs with uh, advanced, intermediate, and beginner slopes. And yes, it is artificial slope, but I think that you know it feels just as good, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to carve up some pow pow. This main slope in the middle is 60 metres wide and 500 metres long, which makes it the fourth longest indoor run in the world. And if you don't know how to ski, get a coach. Here we go. Don't judge me, it's been a long time. See you at the bottom. Oh, that was amazing! Surprisingly, the snow's actually pretty good. It's a little bit on the stickier side, but I guess that's to be expected. I think the best thing about this place is that it's incredibly wide. Very few people here. And the snow's actually really, really good. So it's no wonder the national team was so changed here. <sighs> For advanced riders, there are also ramps, boxes and moguls to try out. But alas, I'll have to leave that for another time, as my next stop is on the other side of town. Well, that certainly looks a little bit out of place. I've come to Volga Mansion, which is this huge estate not far away from Harbin City, where everything is built in Russian style. And here you can actually experience what life was kind of like several centuries ago back in Russia. In case you didn't know, the Volga is Russia's national river and also Europe's longest. Scattered across this estate are replicas of famous Russian buildings. Only here, they've been turned into cafes, restaurants and theatres. You can even rent out one of the villas to complete your fantasy of joining the Russian aristocracy. Oh man, that is pretty impressive. So I'm probably going to butcher this, but that's meant to be a replica of the Novodevichy convent in Moscow. And inside, there's a pretty big gallery devoted to oil paintings. This place is absolutely huge. So the best way to get around is by buggy. <laughs> this is pretty good. It's kind of like a uh, Russian Disneyland, except instead of Mickey Mouse, you have Katusha. <laughs> Wow, look at that. Man, that's amazing. Oh, I like this. No, I much prefer this style, to be honest. This is beautiful. This is a, uh, a replica of St. Nicholas's Cathedral, which was originally in Harbin, but was later destroyed, and uh, now we get to see what it used to look like. Wow.
It's actually uh, pretty humbling to be in here. So this cathedral is incredibly important to Harbin's history because it was the very first building erected in the city and it basically saw the transformation of Harbin from a small fishing village to the city it later became. And in terms of importance, it's actually even more important than that of St. Sophia's Cathedral. But unfortunately, the original was destroyed. However, when they were building this replica, they were actually able to get the original blueprint from the state Russian Museum in St. Petersburg and that's why today we have this wonderful replica of the St. Nicholas Cathedral. Not a single nail was used in the construction of this Russian Orthodox Church. Though it's no longer a functioning house of worship, it's of great sentimental value to the locals. I'm told that elderly Harbonites, who are nostalgic for the past, will often come here specifically to see this cathedral. I feel uh, a little bit like I'm in a Russian fairy tale. That's all the Russian I know. <laughs> oh, I've, I've seen a lot of Matryovska dolls, but I've never actually seen people draw them. A Matryoshka set can have anything from 3 to 50 dolls of decreasing size that fit one inside another. They're most commonly depictions of peasant girls, but there are also ones with fairy tale characters and even Russian presidents. Naturally, the better the painter, the better the doll. I've, uh, I've, I've done a little bit. Mm. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's definitely not passable right now. I think there's probably many layers of paint that needs to go on the doll, but uh, I think we get the rough idea. I think it's fascinating that, not too long ago, Harbin's skyline was dominated by Russian buildings like the kind found at Volga Manor. The city may have changed over the years, but still its Russianness remains very much a part of Harbin's identity. Now, like uh, a lot of people, I used to think that Harbin was best seen in winter, but I've realized now it's just as beautiful in summer and I'm sure the other seasons too. And to be honest, although it's a relatively young city by Chinese standards, in just a little over a hundred years they've been able to become a beautiful modern metropolis that's fiercely protective of its cultural heritage and of course the beautiful natural environment. I'm Taran and I hope you've enjoyed watching this episode of Travelogue in Harbin. In the next episode of Travelogue, we celebrate Chinese Valentine's Day with a very romantic, more like dramatic, encounter with snakes. It's Snake King Festival in the south of China, so come along for a carnival where creature and culture combine with a clang 